Hi, welcome to Town Meeting TV. Um, thanks for tuning in. We are in the midst of our election season, and part of our election season is meeting with folks who are on the ballot, um, but also folks who are using the elect electoral sphere uh, to talk about issues and ideas. And I'm here today with June Goodband. Welcome, thank you, of the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party. Um, June, thanks for being here with us today. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, now, the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party is redefined, and we have the logo here. You can see the L and the U on the turtle unicorn. Um, tell us a little bit about this transition from the Liberty Union Party to the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party. Well, we changed the name because okay. at this point, liberty means something different in many circles than it meant in 1970 when the party started. At that point, liberty meant freedom and the ability to make positive choices in your life and go in the direction you wanted. And now it seems to be used by people who want to ban books and uh, attack certain groups and limit personal choice. And the Liberty Union Party, I mean, it has a history. It started in the 70s. Tell us, do you know a little bit about that history in Vermont? Um, is it a Vermont-based party or a, is it? It's a yeah. Vermont-based party. It's a minor party. There have been some periods when it was a, a major party, but and that they depends sort of on the number. That. It depends on the percentage of votes that you get on the ballot. Is that right? It depends on two things. Okay. One is the number of towns we organize okay. and have uh, town committees in. Okay. And you have to have forty to be a major party, and how many what percentage of votes we get on the ballot. Yeah. Um, I think there's another factor, which I think we have a choice. Um, and in a major party, you have a primary. Yeah. And in the past, they've had some people come in that wanted to be candidates who were really against the main views of the party. They didn't agree with our platform, and they didn't want to have that happen. Yeah. So let's get right into the platform. Tell me a little bit about, you have this uh, brochure here um, outlining your candidacy. You're running for governor. Um, and it outlines some of the party platform ideas. Tell me about that. What is the party platform? <laughs> it's a long platform um, and is really about deconstructing colonialism and imperialism in this country and in the world. It's about making sure that everybody's basic needs are met and that we have a more egalitarian society than we have now. Um, it's um, about having government that limits people as little as possible. So we want to protect people from being hurt by each other, but otherwise people are free to be who they are and do what they want to do. Um, which is not the trend in the country today. So you, on here you have listed housing as a human right, free health care for all, basic needs. You mentioned the ongoing climate crisis. Can you, are there party, are there bullet points around the party platform that you want to share? Uh, there are, but I don't know if I can, I, because we have about an eight page party platform. Just yeah. a second here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pull up the, the short points. Yeah. Democracy at all times and in all places and processes of society. Okay. That means democracy in the workplace. Yeah. Democracy in, in small towns, um, in social groups, and that we find ways to work together and work towards cooperation and building together more than towards competition. So just on that one, and we'll get through these points, um, how does the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party, as an example, um, exemplify democracy in its functioning and in, in its workings? So in our, uh, if we want to make a change to the platform, we have to have consensus. Almost everything we do, we have consensus for. When we nominate candidates, we often have consensus, but we do that by vote. And what's the principle behind consensus that's important to you in terms of democracy? 
we want to listen to every person. Mm -hmm. We want to get all the perspectives. We want to find a way that we are incorporating the interests of everyone and not leaving people out. We don't want to marginalize anyone. Got it. Um, so moving on, you, see you have other Okay, <clears> that, <throat> that we want meaningful and productive work for all with fair compensation. Fair compensation means you have enough to live if you're working full time. You may even have enough to support a family if you're working full time. And that being the owner doesn't mean you should own have much more. In fact, we'd like to not see owners. We'd like to see the workers own businesses. And there is a movement towards that in Vermont. Okay. And does that, does that, are there specific places you see that? Um, coming down into policy decisions that you would implement in Vermont? Does it have to do with the minimum wage? Or it certainly it has to do with a livable wage. A livable wage. <clears throat> it also has to do with um, finding people that have been sidelined and not able to work excluded. I mean, oftentimes people who've been in prison have a very hard time finding work, and when they do find work, it doesn't really use their skills and abilities. Um, creating opportunities for people, making sure that people have positive paths forward in their life. And this isn't a party idea, it's my idea to form um, community care teams that help people when they're having problems of any sort and figure out what are the solutions. And that would include people from economic services, the um, community action, um, aging, Councils on Aging, they've mm -hmm. changed the name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so all of those organizations, um, so that when somebody walked in the door, everybody would be able to know all of the options available and be able to work with people to work out individualized plans that fit for them. And so you don't call this agency and wait for two hours till they tell you, oh, we can't help you, call this one. Mm -hmm. Instead, you walk in and you find out there's somebody there for you. And they actually help you figure out what the resources are, how you can use your own resources as well, and make a plan that works for you in your life. Okay. Housing, yeah. Okay, housing, health care, and education is human rights. Human rights for marginalized groups like women, LGBTQIA, uh, and we're singling out trans because people because they're under attack right now. Seniors, people of color, so-called immigrants, First Nation people. Yeah. We support workers' rights and unionizing. Can we, before you move on, when you call, when you say so-called immigrants, can you just um, hone in on that and why that language? Okay. In this party, we consider humans to be one family, and national boundaries are arbitrary. Throughout history, there's been migrations of people caused by wars, environmental conditions, poverty, and it's just part of how humans work. And now we have these clear lines that you're not supposed to cross. And that's not how people are. We move in and out. If I decide to move to Mexico, I guess I'm an immigrant. If I decide to move, yeah, why? I'm just another person. I better learn the language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but more for practical reasons than political reasons. Yeah. Great, thanks. So you mentioned workers' rights, ending, you want right. to get, yeah. Workers' rights and ending the war on drugs, clear separation of church and state, moving towards a worldwide society in which the resources of the world are used to provide a materially sec secure life for all people while preserving the planet and its resources for future generations. And then I have some things we stand against. Okay. Fascism, colonialism, imperialism, hegemony. War and militarism, systemic racism, nuclear power, and authoritarianism. This is a very abbreviated version. We have like eight pages or nine pages. Yeah, and where can folks find that if they want to read more about this? They can find it at our website, <clears throat> greenmountainpeaceandjusticeparty.org. Great. And how did you come 
Like, how did you as a person come to resonate with this party and get involved um, in this way? I, I was introduced to it by a close friend. Um, I'd known about it always, but I'd been really busy because I was working full time as a therapist. And younger, and when I was younger, I had children and I had other demands in my life. And now I'm able to work part time, and said I need to make a change in the world. And there haven't been many other parties that actually fit with me. They all stop short of actually challenging the structures that need to be changed in order to make real changes for people. Why does the Green Mountain um, Peace and Justice Party and then before that the Liberty Union Party choose to use the election system to promote this kind of change as opposed to say a nonprofit structure or grassroots activism or other kinds of organizing, neighborhood organizing, community organizing? I think people do both. <clears throat> Many of the people in the party are very involved in all those things. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed about um, nonprofit system is it really is set up to divide people. That once you're a nonprofit, you have to scrape for funding, you have to compete for funding, and uh, the idea of trying to continue becomes paramount in an organization's life. Um, and then you have who's on whose turf and how do you work together or not work together. Um, and everyone has to define a specific narrow mission, whereas the party has, this, you can hear from the platform, we have a broad mission. Mm -hmm. We want to get the word out that things could be done differently. And the electoral process allows us to get the word out and we could eventually have, have someone actually in government that's having a strong voice for the people. And that's, well, that's what you're hoping to do. You're running for governor. So do you, right. how, what, what are your hopes in moving, in getting elected? What would you hope to accomplish in taking that office with this platform? I would hope to build on the groups that all of those non, all the work that all those nonprofit groups have done. Uh-huh where they've identified this is the change that needs to happen uh -huh. and make the connection between that and the legislators and pro make proposals that create real change. I really want to work on making sure that people are able to meet their basic needs, which is not the case in Vermont. Yeah. And changing the way we judge, uh, changing the way we judge success um, or economic well-being, whereas currently they look at consumer demand and GDP and that sort of thing, to look at the well-being of the people who are struggling the most. If right now in this country we have a higher rate of poverty than in India, and this is just wrong, we have one of the wealthiest countries that's ever existed, and we have this massive poverty rate. And some of this has happened because I, I say this on this, in my lifetime, wealth has been redistributed. The gap between the wealthy and the rest of us has gotten bigger. When I was born, the maximum federal tax rate was 90%. Now it's 37%. Well, this is certainly that line um, that the gap between um, the rich and the poor has grown is certainly part of Bernie Sanders' campaign, you know, is part of his stump speech. And he was, of course, started at the Liberty Union Party. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess speak more on that issue of what, how you use this election cycle and, okay. and, and why, use, why use elections to tell this story. It's a time when people might be listening. Uh huh that people tend to be not very interested in politics, and it's rather disturbing. Um, and even when they are interested, it's hard to get the word out, because nonprofits can't support any political speech or any candidate. Uh -huh. They can't have, to set up a forum takes money and time that most of them don't have in their mission. You mean being a 501c3, you can't be involved in politics. You'd have to be a 501c6 or some yes. other, yeah. Yep. Yep. So 
most of the groups that we are in line with are 501c3s. They're people that are working for the, the poor, the working class, and trying to make a more egalitarian society. The marginalized people of yeah. all sorts. How is your camp, how are you being, like, how are you finding the campaigning to go? How are you getting out to folks and how are you being received as you're doing that? I find I'm getting received fairly well. That a lot of people who I wouldn't expect to necessarily agree with me, like they might hold some positions that sound like they're kind of right wing. But when I say, we don't need this many people in prisons and we could instead redirect some of that funding to support people in communities, they're right with me. So I find that it's, a, or, and when we say government shouldn't be controlled by the rich, which it is now, mm -hmm. I find a lot of people are right with me on that. So I feel Can like I'm Can you talk about that a little bit? How, in what ways are, is government controlled? What, in what ways do you see government being controlled by the rich? Campaigns are funded primarily by wealthy people. And they can't be funded by poor people because poor people don't have the money. Um, and they spend massive amounts of money on campaigns. Um, so that's one way. And then beyond that, they pay lobbyists. And so they can have a constant voice in the ear of all the legislators and of the governor saying, this is how you should do things, this is how it should be. Mm -hmm. And whenever, we're all influenced by who we're talking to. We're all influenced, um, in fact, I would go so far as to say we construct a consensual reality mm. in a social context. So- Are you gonna say more about that? What does that mean? <laughs> what that means is that the people you talk to help you form your ideas about what's real and what's true. Mm -hmm. and it can be changed if you're in dialogue with people. But oftentimes people are only in dialogue with the people in their small circle. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens from infancy. Our ideas about the world are shaped by the culture we're in, by the people we're with, and we shape each other. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, what was, your, what was your growing up like and how did it form? the person that you are today that's choosing to run for governor as part of the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party. I feel like my growing up was very long ago. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, well, we're still growing up, yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, so I, my father was a pipe fitter and definitely a union person. I would say he was also fairly prejudiced. Was that here in Vermont or was it in Pennsylvania? In, uh, upstate New York. Upstate New York, okay. So. Um, and I switched families. Here, here's a key thing, probably. When I was in fifth grade, I lived with my father and my next oldest sister, who was about to turn 18. Mm -hmm. And um, my father was drinking a lot, and I wasn't getting a whole lot of care, and I did terribly in school. I failed fifth grade, and they made me do summer school. And then I went to sixth grade at a new school when I moved to live with my sister. Not, not the one that was 18, an older one, yeah. slightly older. And um, they put me in the top classes. And from then on, I was an honor student. I was in a different family. Mm -hmm. I was in a different context. And it wasn't a perfect family. I mean, none of these families are perfect. But it made all the difference in my life. And I went from believing and being treated as a person who had inferior intelligence mm -hmm. to being recognized as a person who could think. It made a huge difference. Yeah, that, that expectations breed um, the reality. And so there must have been, is there something in there that is the like, the nascent, um, the nascent growth of what we'll see things like housing as a human right. And, and I guess, how do you feel like this is different from the Republican Party or the Democratic <laughs> Party in their approach? Because we see some of these things echoed. Certainly. Okay, what I hear in the... <clears throat> well, first the, start to like, okay. I must okay. have three questions so there. First yeah. <laughs> question about where it comes from. Yeah. More of it comes from my work as a therapist over for more than 30 years. Okay that I see how we put obstacles in people's way 
And when somebody has fallen down, it's almost impossible for them to get up. And not only that, it's impossible for their children to get up mm -hmm. and their children's children. Yeah, that's systemic racism as an example. Or Sy as a, yes, not as a systemic racism and systemic poverty. Yeah. That it's very difficult for the child that doesn't have access to resources to move ahead in the world. And more and more, I mean, when I was young, we had ways of having access to resources for people who didn't have much money. And they've been restricting that more and more since about 1980. Yeah. Um, with right to work programs or the work right to, I mean, you have to work in order to qualify. Or oh, you have yeah, to, there's work right, fair, so like, there's yeah. work fair. Right to work programs are that you can't have union shops, that yeah. everybody can work whether they're in the union or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can't have fully union shops. Yeah. And so that breaks apart unions because the unions stand up for everybody, but only some people pay and support them. Yeah. And that means the people who pay have to pay higher dues and they may grumble and want to take advantage of, we don't have to. Yep. It's a union busting tac yep. tactic. So I've just seen people who, who struggle so much, who may work two or three jobs and because they have bad credit, they can't get an apartment. Um, people who the system undermines at every corner. Yeah. And a lot of these people had severe trauma at some point in their life, often in childhood, and they aren't able to get out of it. They're stuck because as they start to grow and heal from the trauma, more traumatic things happen to them yeah. over and over. Uh -huh. um, we say we're, that the drug epidemic is a problem, but we don't create clear avenues for people who are in recovery mm -hmm. and adequate support for them to be able to stay in recovery. So that's a little bit of like your, your working life has helped inform mm -hmm. your passion around these ideas. Mm -hmm. So talk about how the Green Mountain um, Peace and Justice Party is different from the Republicans Ooh. and the Democrats, in, and specifically in Vermont, because I think the parties. Okay. Or at least there's a sense that the parties are different here. Okay. Um, I find in Vermont the Democrats stand for a lot of really positive things and try to make things work. But they always stop short of the change that needs to happen in order to make it work, which is, um, and not always, I shouldn't say that, they, they increased um, property taxes, which has, is kind of mixed, but we needed to fund education. The problem with increasing property taxes is that it's a regressive tax. And it's, it's not a tax that affects the people who can afford to pay more than the people who can't afford to pay. It trickles down onto renters, because if you own a property mm -hmm. and your property tax, you pass it on to the renters, potentially. Right. And we do have income sensitivity and renters rebate. We do have some of that, but but it's not enough. Uh huh. And we stop short and say we can't do anything that's not great for business and that's not great for um, the people who are well off. And realistically, I've never been in a situation where I've said I can't feed all my children. And Vermont says we can't feed all our children. We're not that poor. We can find a way, but we're not willing to find a way. Um, when I went to the Democratic debate um, for our uh, for the Senate representative, state Senate, in your in in my area in Windsor in, County, Windsor County, okay. um, there was one person. <clears throat> who was ready to do creative thinking and think outside the box. And the others all said, well, we need public-private cooperation. Everything has to be done through the private system. And when you do everything through the private system, you're doing it f through the for-profit system. If you're, their goal is to make a profit, the goal of government needs to be to look after the public welfare and the public good. Mm -hmm. And those often don't go together. 
Do you have, have you had experience in and around Montpelier to understand how some of these ideas would move forward if you were um, to succeed in your campaign? I think I see success as if I get the word out that things could be done differently, if I develop a blueprint for effective governance that legislators and whoever is governor look at, mm -hmm. um, that would be a huge success for me. If I actually were elected, I think the way these ideas would get traction is that I would work with people to make suggestions that go beyond what they've thought of before and get people to try new new approaches. I don't think they'd do everything at once, but some things we have to act on quickly. We have too many homeless people here. We have the second highest homeless rate in the country, and we have a limited time to address climate change. Mm -hmm. So success for you is not just winning the election, and I even, even the term winning, because Peter Diamondstone, who of course was one of the founders right. of the Liberty Union, was very much against the idea that elections were a sport. Right, so you didn't I know run, that. <laughs> you didn't run for office, You didn't. it wasn't a race. That's why I say I'm a candidate for governor. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so you would like to also influence the other major party candidates mm -hmm. in understanding some of these ideas. Are there ways outside of the political forums that you are working or the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party is working to push these ideas forward and into Vermont's political thinking? Um, well, I think that we, that everyone writes letters to the editor and everyone ask their legislators to do different things and mm -hmm. complains when they don't do what we want. Yeah. <laughs> and ex expresses that in different ways. Yeah. Um, I think that we talk to people and say, why are we putting up with this? Yeah. Why is this okay? Why is it okay that your mother is homeless and has to sleep on your couch? Um, because she has a back problem which causes her to be unable to work. Yeah. Um, why are the systems not set up to take care of people? Why is your sister gonna lose her house because she got cancer and can't work right now? And those questions. Um, the real things in people's lives, and oddly I've found that the media has caused many people to put what they're told above their own perceptions. Mm. So, yeah, say more about that. It's an interesting idea. Um, well, for one thing, I hear a lot of people complaining about the problem at the border is a huge problem. I'm hearing about this in Vermont, and I say, have you had problems with immigrants? And they say, well, no, but it's a problem for everybody. I haven't had any problem. Um, or some others, like, oh, the economy is doing well. Wait a minute, how are you doing? Well, I'm like really afraid that I'm not gonna be able to retire ever. Mm -hmm. But the economy is doing well. Um, you know, I think we all do what we can when you say outside of this. I showed up for a discussion about the local hospitals and yeah. the idea that they might shut some down. Yeah. And I suggested, have they looked at the hospital system in Norway, or the medical care system in Norway, where they spend less than half as much per capita on health care and have much better outcomes and much better satisfaction yeah. with the health care system? Yeah. And I got the response that in Norway, uh, this man had been to Norway, they pay 50% in taxes. And he said he, there was a family that he knew where there were two doctors and one doctor's pay paid for all their living expenses and the other one paid taxes. Well, those were two doctors. They weren't the people at the bottom of the economic system there. And then I think, what did they get for that half, half of their money going into taxes? They got a secure retirement. They got disability insurance and unemployment insurance. They got education and childcare starting from young, being a young child all the way through, um, through post-secondary education. They got a low crime rate. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure what more we could ask for. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to pay that for that. Yeah. If I had it, I don't yeah. always have, you know, but if you have it and you can live a decent life and still pay 50% in taxes, then that seems fine. Yeah. And I know the poorer people didn't pay 50% in taxes. Yeah. But still had a decent life. Yeah. Well, June, good band. Is there anything more that you would like to cover before we close up today? We have a couple minutes left. Um, I just think it's really important to invest in people and communities and that we can do this if we, in, by not investing in things that we know don't work. The war on drugs has been around a long time. It doesn't work. The, I mean, we have more of a drug problem than we ever did. Um, prohibition doesn't work. We tried it back in the 20s and it doesn't work. You're talking about? Um, prohibition of any drug and, and drugs, alcohol yeah. is a drug. Yeah. Um, we need to find other ways to engage with that and control it. Yeah. Um, putting everybody in prison, we have a huge population of people in prison at huge cost. They're talking about putting $500 million into building prisons in the state. Not necessary. Most of those people will be in five years or less. Many of the people there are awaiting trial. It's not necessary to do that. It doesn't increase public safety, and we can increase public safety if we invest in families and communities and build strong social structures. Well, thank you for joining us and sharing some of this. Um, the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party, if folks want to know more, you can see that up on the screen there, the Green Mountain Peace and Justice Party. Um, Today, this is part of our ongoing election coverage, um, bringing you ideas from different political parties and some of the candidates. Tune into more at cctv.org. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel using that platform. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you.